All right, good morning, everyone. It is 8 a.m., so we'll go ahead and get started. And I will be presenting the first couple cases. Maybe. There we go. All right, so this first case is a 13-year-old Schnauzer mix. Um, they say severe keratitis and ulceration, suspect lens luxation, and they suspect all the things are due to the cataract or a cataract. Um, so the IOP was 50, so definitely glaucomatous. And um, the they say that the dog is diabetic as well. So perhaps all leading back to a diabetic cataract. So here is the gross photo. Um, what we can see here is that the cornea is completely opaque and it's a little bit roughened and it's also quite thick. You can see it actually goes from here all the way up to here. So it's quite thick. Um, so probably at least some edema in the deeper parts here. Um, the lens is kind of uh, opaque in certain areas, so that's pretty good for a cataract. And then there's asteroid hyalosis uh, in the vitreous, and then the retina is looking all right, at least it's not detached, and we can't really see the optic nerve head in this image. Um, and I think that's about all we can say with the gross photo. So we will go ahead and swap to the slide. All right, so so here uh, from this magnification, we can see once again that that cornea is quite thick and there's some hypercellularity in the stroma there. The epithelium is also um, not attached and it's also torn. So this is the definition of an indolent ulcer where you have epithelial non-attachment with tear and so that uh, corneal stroma is exposed. Um, the iris is slightly incompletely sampled, but we will get to look at it at a higher mag. Um, here's the lens. You can see there's quite a bit of uh, cortical lens fiber uh, degeneration and loss, actually. Um, the lens capsule is actually not very well sampled here, but uh, you can see how irregular the remaining lens nucleus is. So that's pretty good for a cataract. And then the back of the globe is um, pretty uh, unremarkable at this magnification despite the fact that they have diagnosed glaucoma. All right, so we'll get started here at the cornea. So once again, you can see that very nice uh, epithelial non-attachment. And then when we go higher mag on that epithelium, you can see that it's a little bit disorganized. So let's go over here. So in this area, you can see it is hyperplastic and a little bit keratinized on the surface, uh, but there is a pretty well-defined basal layer here. And then um, as the cells progress toward the surface, they get a little bit bigger. So that's uh, characteristic of squamous, um, squamous um, differentiation. Um, however, when we get into this area where the epithelium is not attached, we lose that basal layer and we have these little whorl formations in the epithelium. So that's called loss of polarity where the epithelium no longer knows which way is up and which way is down. Um, and then in that exposed stroma, uh, you can see it's a little bit darker purple there. And that is because uh, there are neutrophils and other inflammatory cells in the stroma here. And also in this picture, you can see uh, that there are quite a few blood vessels. So this is a very well vascularized cornea um, that's probably associated with the corneal ulcer. Um, and then interestingly enough, this, this cornea has more going on. So as we move deeper into the stroma, we've got this accumulation of this sort of basophilic flocculent stuff. And there are some cells around these accumulations of that stuff. So let's take a higher peek at that. Closer peek. And let's go higher still. All right, um, so what these guys are, are all macrophages. And you can see some of them have this really vacuolated cytoplasm. So this is characteristic of a lipid laden macrophage, these guys up here, uh, where that's sort of finely vacuolated, uh, maybe looks a little bit granular. And then they're sort of all surrounding this stuff. 
some of this could be extracellular, some of it could be intracellular in the cytoplasm of the macrophages, but these are lipid-laden macrophages. So this is a very nice example of a lipid keratopathy. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go here. So let's move into the eye now. So we'll just take a quick peek at the iris. Uh, so in the iris stroma, you can see there are some cells. Let's take a quick peek at who they are. Most likely, they're going to be a, a mix of lymphocytes and plasma cells. Yep, so most of these are lymphocytes. There might be a few plasma cells here and there. Uh, over here are some nice plasma cells right there with a perinuclear clear zone. Um, and then when we look at the surface of the iris, um, this should not be here. So this is a pre irritable membrane. And if we track along the front of the iris, we might find a few blood vessels. So that makes it a nice pre irritable fibrovascular membrane. Um, and as we follow that down into, so the inflammatory cells extend into and occupy the trabecular meshwork. And that PIFM, that pre irritable fibrovascular membrane, does wrap right around um, and connect to uh, decimase membrane. So we have a peripheral anterior sneakia. So that is a nice explanation for why this dog had an elevated IOP. So let's go take a peek at the cataract. So as I said, the lens capsule is actually fairly poorly sampled. Um, but what we do see here is that um, where you should have at least so that that could be artifact. I mean, it is artifact that it's not sampled very well. Um, but what we do have is basically degeneration and loss of a lot of the cortical lens fibers. And when we look a little bit closer here, um, there are these little globules. And so that those are very nice examples of morgagnon globules. So that's a, a hallmark of lens, dege lens degeneration. And um, because we're overall just missing some of those lens fibers in the cortex, that means that there's been probably leakage through an intact lens capsule, um, which then no doubt has encouraged the um, lymphoplasmacytic uveal stromal inflama uh, inflammation, as well as the pre fibrovascular membrane. Um, also, right behind the lens there, these little purple blobs are asteroid bodies. So that's the uh, histologic correlate of the sparkly things that we saw in the gross photo. So those are asteroid bodies. And then let's move to the back. So overall, from this magnification, at least the retina and optic nerve don't look too bad. And that happens sometimes where a dog or a cat will have an elevated intraocular pressure when measured by tonopen, um, but not necessarily have uh, advanced or obvious histologic degeneration of the retina and optic nerve. So we are seeing a few ganglion cells that still remain. And the retina itself actually maintains pretty normal layering. So we've got the nice outer layer, outer nuclear layer, inner nuclear layer. And then here's the inner plexiform layer, the ganglion cell layers here, although it is a little bit sparse. And then the nerve fiber layer is still pretty much intact. The optic nerve head itself looks pretty good. Um, it's not necessarily atrophied, cupped, or gliotic. And then when we look at the retina on the other side, um, we see similar, similar findings. So we've got a decent number of ganglion cells. So this is definitely a case where we would diagnose glaucoma as per history, not confirmed histologically. It doesn't mean that we're telling them that they're liars. It just means that we can't correlate it. We can't confirm it histologically. So the other cool thing that's happening in the back of this eye is that the walls of the arterioles, uh, of some of them at least, are greatly expanded by more foamy macrophages. So, we look, so here's the lumen of this blood vessel. And so all of this is in the tunica media. And you can see um, that all of these guys are those foamy macrophages, similar to the ones that we saw in the cornea. Um, so this is more lipid-laden macrophages. So this is... Um, the hallmark, histologic hallmark of atherosclerosis. Um, and so to put this whole case together, this dog was diabetic um, and it had a cataract and they thought that's what um, caused all of the problems in the eye. And they're probably right, except for this um, beautiful uh, vascular lesion as well. So we had a hypermature diabetic cataract um, with marked choroidal atherosclerosis and lipid keratopathy. So we assume that somehow 
this well, this dog is probably hyperlipidemic or dyslipidemic or something, either hypercholesterolemic or triglyceridemic or something like that. And somehow there's been lipid leakage into the corneal stroma. Um, and that may be associated with the fact that the corneal stroma is vascularized first, and then the, the blood vessels brought the lipid to the corneal stroma that then incited the granulomatous uh, response. Um, and then overall, but other than that, I'd say this, the vascular lesion is actually fairly incidental for this eye. Um, so the, the choroidal um, atherosclerosis that we saw was um, probably not causing major problems uh, at this point. Um, but ultimately, probably the diabetic cataract um, led to a pretty severe or at least <laughs> moderate to marked uh, lymphoplasmocytic uveitis with fibrovascular membrane and sneakia formation and then subsequent glaucoma. So it got a nice story for this one. There's also a mixed schnauzer. So who knows if there's a um, oh, yeah. primary hyperlipidemia component. Any history of diabetic nephropathy that resulted in uh, The question was, was there any ev uh, history of diabetic nephropathy mm -hmm. um, to lead to the thing, to the, um, well, to lipid problems? And we don't know. All they gave us was diabetes. So which we're grateful for because it really helps in this case, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So there we go. All right. Moving on next case. Um, this is a 10 year old Japanese chin mix dog. The history we got was glaucoma and ocular discharge diagnosed about a week ago. Uh, stromal ulcer diagnosed, um, a few days after that, in addition to cataract, hyphema, and scleral mass. Uh, in parentheses, rule out neoplasia, maybe granulation tissue, it's hard to read the handwriting, or staphyloma. Um, no history of trauma. Uh, and so here is our gross photo. And so, okay. So here's the gross photo. Uh, here's the cornea at the top. It's a little bit cloudy, so it might be some corneal stromal edema. There's some tan material in the anterior chamber, which is probably some mix of fibrin and inflammatory cells. The lens is uh, fairly opaque. Um, so we definitely have a cataract. And then also um, there's a defect in that anterior lens. Oh my gosh, the mouse is not behaving itself. There's a defect in the anterior cortical uh, surface of the lens. Um, and then the vitreous is uh, cloudy and fairly solid. So it's a little bit of a cloudy gel and the retina is detached, at least on this side, we can't really see the optic nerve head. Um, and then uh, there's a little bit of hemorrhage right in here and maybe more of that similar material that's here sort of coating the ciliary body on this side. So let's go ahead and take a peek at higher magnification. Um, so we can see that um, here's the cornea. So there's uh, some purpleness to the peripheral corneal stroma, which is probably vascularization. Um, as I said, there's some gunk in the anterior chamber, which is a little bit purplish pinkish in this area in this at this magnification. Um, there is a nice uh, anterior cortical defect of the lens. So something has happened to this lens. All of that off-white gelatinous material in the vitreous corresponds to um, increased protein in the vitriol, in the vitreous itself, um, which some of which is at least fibrin. And then um, the retina and optic nerve once again look pretty good. Uh, they did say that there was glaucoma. The IOP was 43. So. All right. So we'll get started at the front here. Got some very nice uh, peripheral stromal vascularization. So to age a lesion, um, we look at how far into the corneal stroma the blood vessels have extended. And so uh, it takes about two to three days for the blood vessels to start growing into the corneal stroma at the limbus. So we have at least a two or three day duration. And then it's about one cornea's width per day. So we've got a minimum of maybe five days of duration here. And they say that the clinical signs started about a week ago. So that kind of makes sense um, in this case. Um, so once again, we have 
all of the junk in the anterior chamber. So let's take a quick peek and see what that is. We have a bunch of red blood cells. And then mostly, I think what we have are uh, neutrophils. Probably some of them are viable and some of them are degenerate. And then we, when we go to the sparser areas, we see all this fibrillar eosinophilic material, and that is our fibrin. So we've got a nice fibrinoseparative and hemorrhagic um, and endophthalmitis, at least in the anterior chamber. We'll see if it's elsewhere in the globe. So we'll move back a little bit further. So here we have the iris leaflet, and um, it is also a little bit uh, purple, so a little bit hypercellular that no doubt there's inflammation in the iris stroma. And then uh, right down here, we see that anterior lens capsule, which it is quite thick as it should be, uh, but you can see that it's discontinuous for one thing, and also that the neutrophils are starting to dissect into it. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that neutrophils can really only do to a lens capsule that has been broken for some other reason. Uh, I think we pick it up again here, but it's artifactually not sampled well right there. So let's go take a quick peek. And also, as I said, we've got the anterior cortical defect, and we've got loss of those lens fibers in this area. Uh, neutrophils are dissecting between these still intact lens fibers and also lining up on the ends of those lens fibers. So these guys are trying to munch away at all of that lens material. So something has caused lens capsule rupture in this eye. And the next thing that we always think about when we try to when we see this is, are there bacteria anywhere? And it took me a little while to find them, but um, I will show you where they are. Oftentimes they are quite distant from where the majority of the inflammatory cells are, which is true in this case. In this case, we also have a little bit of posterior cortical lens fiber degeneration and loss. Um, sometimes you'll find the bacteria in the cracks of the lens, um, but in this case, they're actually hanging out back here. Let's see if I can find them again. There they are. So they're actually forming little chains here. So their individual morphology is a little bit hard to, to work out, but I think probably some of them are cocci. That's the most common at least. Um, but we did not do a gram stain, but presumably these would be gram positive cocci. Okay, let's continue on with our tour around the eye. Um, it looks like actually the lens cap, the posterior lens capsule is also absent here. So something has ruptured both the anterior and the posterior lens capsule. Let's see if we can follow it around and find it. There's one end of it right there. And then, as I said, the, the vitreous itself was sort of cloudy and off-white grossly. And what we see when we go higher mag here is a lot more of that finely fibrillar eosinophilic material or fibrin, and then a bunch of um, variably degenerate inflammatory cells. So a lot of these are probably macrophages. So we've got a little bit of an endophthalmitis throughout the globe. And here's a little bit of that hemorrhage, as I said, in the gross photo. And then as we follow back, um, so there are inflammatory cells in the entire uvea here. Um, the retina is diffusely detached and there are inflammatory cells in the subretinal space. Um, that right there, uh, when you have junk in the subretinal space tells you that it is a true retinal detachment. Another way that we can confirm that in this case is that the um, inner and outer segments of the photoreceptors, which, are this, which is this pink layer here, is uh, are shorter than they should be. So we've got atrophy of the frilly frills or the inner and outer segments of the photoreceptors. Um, sometimes, but not always, the retinal pigmented epithelial cells will be hypertrophied in response to retinal detachment. Personally, I'm not so convinced with these guys here, but um, sometimes they lie, so you can't you can't trust them entirely. Um, and then we've got some more inflammatory cells in the optic nerve head. There's probably some inflammatory cells here and there in the retina, but the retina is detached, uh, but otherwise maintains normal layering except for the shortening of the inner and outer segments. So that is the majority of the lesions in this case. So let's go back over to our PowerPoint. Um, so as I said, we've got um, lens capsule rupture 
Uh, we've got bacteria in the lens, which is pretty much consistent with a contaminated penetrating injury. Um, we call this septic implantation syndrome, where you have lens capsule rupture and a very lens-centric inflammatory um, milieu, I guess. Uh, so it's most of the inflammation was right around the lens. It was in the iris um, and in the anterior chamber. Um, we did not actually sample or identify uh, breaks in Desimé's membrane, uh, which we do sometimes to correspond with um, lens capsule rupture. But um, the most common cause of this, in our opinion, is a cat. Um, so a cat with sharp claws takes a swipe at a dog eye, in particular a Japanese chin mix dog that might have some buggy eyes to start with. Um, and as you think about it, cats don't necessarily poke straight ahead the way the Three Stooges do, but they actually come from the side with their sharp claws. So it's not <clears throat> unusual that we don't find breaks in Desimé's membrane. Um, and it's not also not unusual to see breaks in the posterior lens capsule as well as the anterior. Um, so there we go. So we've got lens capsule rupture with a marked separative phacitis, intralenticular cocci, and a hypermature cataract consistent with septic implantation syndrome. And then there's a bunch of other stuff going on there as well. In this case, um, they said glaucoma, the IOP was 43. Um, we had plenty of retinal ganglion cells. The optic nerve head didn't look uh, actually atrophied, although it was inflamed. Um, so we basically said as per history in this case, because we can't really comment much about it. Um, so there we go. Any questions or anything? Are you handling chat over there in the under? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right, any questions? Anything else? Cool. All right, this, okay. I meant to grab another slide that went with this case, but I forgot. Okay, this is a, nine-year-old pit bull mix, um, which actually had had an evisceration done several weeks prior to this. Uh, sadly, then the disease progressed, um, and then they ended up uh, removing the rest of the ocular tissue. So they did an evisceration, which is where they scoop everything out of the eye. They put a silicone ball in the eye, which maintains the shape of the globe. The cornea is still there, so it kind of looks like they still have a normal eye. Um, and then, um, uh, okay, sorry. So then, um, unfortunately this disease progressed. Uh, so we also received the evisceration sample, which is the slide that I meant to grab from our archive and I forgot. Um, but we diagnosed, uh, a uveal lymphoma in that evisceration sample. Um, and so when we received this sample, we're assuming that this is going to be a similar uh, disease process, but anyway. Um, so this is what the, the sample looked like. So I, we hemisected it and I was actually the one to gross this one. So I removed the silicone ball, uh, cause it's just easier to cut it. Um, you can cut through them, uh, but I just removed it once I was able to pop it out. And so what we have is, uh, believe it or not, this is the cornea up front here. And so here's the back of the eye. This is probably that where the optic nerve is. This cavity is where that silicone ball was, had been. Um, so there's a lot of hemorrhage in there, and that's probably not unusual after an evisceration. There's quite a bit of hemorrhage when you scoop all that stuff out of the eye. Um, and then uh, we have this sort of pinkish, reddish, off-white-ish mass that is looks like it's inside the eye, at least in this area here, as well as it's effacing the cornea. There might be some cornea left up here, and it's uh, effacing and expanding that limbal sclera. Sorry, I think I've missed when, when was the... Oh, okay. Good question. Um, it was not that long. It was probably like two or three weeks prior to this. Yeah. Maybe a month. Based on the number there, 2000. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it grew fast. Yeah, so it came back fast. Um, <clears throat> and I believe um, the story was that the ophthalmologist knew that something bad was happening in this eye tried desperately to convince the owners to, to enucleate and the owners didn't want to. So they did an evisceration, kind of uh, not unexpectedly got a bad diagnosis and then, then had to go back in and enucleate. So I believe the ophthalmologists tried to do their best. Um, okay, so we have two sections of this eye. Uh, we've got the, the full section and then we have, oh, wow, Heidi brought us the evisceration. Thank you so much, Heidi. Woohoo! All right, so we'll start with that. Someone's watching though. Yes, oh, right. Yeah, she always watches. Heidi's amazing. 
All right, so here we go. Uh, I won't do the low mag view, uh, it's an evisceration. So um, as our histotechs call it, uh, it's eye vomit. So it's just all the eye bits on the eye, except uh, that, are, that have lost all of their uh, relationship. Uh, anyway, so um, here is, you should never see this uh, degree of hypercellularity in evisceration because that's bad news. Um, that means that something bad is happening. So let's take a quick peek we have here. So we've got a densely cellular population of cells. <laughs> As we get higher mag, they're kind of ugly looking. So mostly what we're seeing here is nuclei of these guys. So we're seeing very little cytoplasm. We've got some coarsely clumped chromatin and some really large, prominent single nucleoli. So that's a nucleus, nucleolus. Um, and so it's mixed with maybe a tiny bit of uveal stroma, but for the most part, the uveal stroma is totally effaced. Um, there are mitotic figures all over the place. Um, so we've got a really uh, significant round cell population here. Um, so this is a red blood cell, and you can compare the size of the nuclei to a red blood cell. And they're at least one and a half to two times the size of a red blood cell or the width uh, diameter of a red blood cell. So that means this is an intermediate to large cell lymphoma. Uh, which usually indicates that it's fast growing and can be aggressive. So that was the evisceration sample. Let's go on to our, let's do this low mag jobby thing here. So uh, just like the gross image, um, here is that mass that was at the front of the eye. Here's some remaining corneal stroma. Uh, you can see that that, that uh, neoplastic population really does just infiltrate and efface a lot of what we have left here. So here's that remaining ocular cavity. There's our adorable little optic nerve still at the back of the eye. Um, there's some of that hemorrhage that we could see in the gross photo as well. And so there we go. So it's right on, it has come right through the limbus and has formed this mass. And we have an extra slice of it uh, that we did in case um, immunohistochemistry, oh wait. That doesn't work very well uh, in case they wanted to do immunohistochemistry. So here are those cells in the corneal stroma. And actually, I'm just going to swap over to our smaller section, which might be slightly better preserved. Um, and that's what we did the immunohistochemistry on. So... So we've got a little bit of surface epithelium there, either corneal or conjunctival. And then here's, I think, the limbal portion of this mass. So the cells are pretty well, oops, sorry, a little blurry. Well preserved there. And as Dr. D always says that those are round cells, they're discrete cells, and they pass the tweezer test which means that um, each of these cells can be, you could imagine that it could be plucked out from this sea of cells without really disturbing its neighbors. And that's because round cells don't really have much or any connection to their neighbors the way other cells do in other tissues. Um, so we've got, um, I think the architecture of the cells is pretty, is nicely preserved in this compared to the evisceration sample. And that might just be due to handling artifact that's necessary in an evisceration sample. Uh, but anyway, so we've got really big cells, uh, same similar large nuclei, um, with one to two uh, prominent nucleoli. And then uh, here's at least one mitotic figure. So they were pretty plentiful in this. Let's see what it actually was, what the mitotic figure count was. 91 mitotic figures in 10 fields. So pretty high rate there. Um, so we offered them immunohistochemistry and uh, they took us up on it. So our main differential here was lymphoma. And interestingly enough, um, and to our um, surprise, uh, the neoplastic cells actually express both CD3 and CD20. So this right here is CD20. Um, and so uh, the chromogen used was brown and CD20 should mark the membrane of the neoplastic cells. And so we have very nice crisp membranous uh, marking or positivity uh, of the neoplastic cells um, uh, meaning they're uh, at least expressing CD20, which historically and traditionally is a B cell marker, B lymphocyte marker. So now let's go back to our, let's move on to our CD3 stain. 
CD3 marks T lymphocytes. Surprisingly enough, the cells also express some positivity for CD3. It's not quite as crisp and membranous as it was for the CD20. But we were still pretty convinced that it was true, that it was real staining. So you can see the cells are outlined pretty well by the ground, brown chromogen, so they are expressing CD. Wow, I can't get into focus. It's not just me. Um, anyway, so they are they seem to be expressing both CD3 and CD20. Um, so that's really unusual because CD3 and CD20 indicate that a lymphocyte has, has differentiated into either a B cell or a T cell. Um, and really, um, they shouldn't be expressing both. <laughs> So this is a really weird case. Um, this has been reported before in other tissues, not the eye to my knowledge. Um, it's more common, I think, to have double negative lymphomas where they don't express either CD3 or CD20. Um, and that really just um, indicates a very poorly differentiated lymphoma. So um, I believe um, in other tissues, when this has been described, they assume that there was, um, that it's actually a, I think a T cell lymphoma with aberrant CD20 expression, um, but honestly, we have no idea what the, what is the case here. So, I don't, and I'm not sure how we really tell the difference. Yeah, there's some folks here on the on the chat, Maria and Danielle were saying that they they see that too in dogs, and that exactly what you said that they're more likely to be um, T cell lymphomas, and they know that because. Uh, they're either negative for Vax5 after the fact, or they have T cell clonality. Cool. That's why some of them had stopped using CD20 as the first line marker for B cells. Yep. Unfortunately, that's the only one that we have mm -hmm. here. <laughs> but yeah. All right. So that's it. So that's a head scratcher of sorts. Now I will pass it off to Leandro. Right, so here is my first case. <laughs> As you can see, a typical uh, sample right off the bat. So this is a 10-year-old female spay domestic short-haired cat. The submitted tissue has been described as other, and they named it a retrobulbar tissue. So we'll discuss that a little bit. Uh, the history that came with it, uh, employee pet, the eye was enucleated as a kitten. And remember, this cat is now 10. So it was enucleated as a kitten uh, at a shelter for unknown reasons. Uh, the ocular site has been having discharge for approximately six months, and they've been treated with numerous uh, antibiotics with no improvement. They did an orbital exploratory and uh, scooped it all out and this uh, and submitted to us. So this is what we end up with. Um, it's hard to identify a lot of uh, what we have here, but... You can see right there, there's some haired skin. So probably close to the surface. Um, <clears throat> kind of Monday morning quarter back in here because I've seen the slides, but pay attention to this kind of linear black material coming deeper in this uh, tissue. And there's a lot of this uh, redundant tissue. If you do an enucleation and get an orbital tissue, you shouldn't have this much um, tissue left behind or present, let's put it that way, right? So we'll uh, see what we end up with. So we cut that in half, send it in and prayed for the best. This is what we end up with. Get a better, there you go. So. Um, orientation wise, here is uh, again, it's kind of at the borders and the slide falls off a little bit. 
So here you can see some hair follicles. So we are at that haired skin area that I showed you guys on the, on the gross image. There's a cartilage. The shape of this cartilage with kind of a uh, round structure next to it that looks like a tendon suggests that this is the trochlea. So at least we know this is dorsal. <laughs> Not that that helps much. Um, and if you go around, there's more, um, it's like muscle. Uh, and here, some epithelium covered surface that looks like conjunctiva. So imagine this being the ocular or the remained, re remaining surface of this tissue. And this is deeper. When we get a little, keep going down, there is a more uh, recognizable sort of organized collagen that resembles sclera, maybe limbus, maybe a little bit of cornea there. And uh, I usually, uh, suggest that when people are lost in the eye, when there's a lot of destruction, look for black. Because if you have black pigmentation, that usually correlates with the uveal tissue. So there, those two streaks of black tissue that we saw on a gross image uh, correspond to these areas. So let's take a look. And of course, <laughs> the elephant in the room, this massive amount of cells uh, with some areas of necrosis and survival around blood vessels, right? So there's nothing obviously recognizable as an eye, but there are things that are um, reminiscent of ocular tissues, which um, wouldn't necessarily expect because of the history of an enucleation. Then um, let's move back towards the front or or C front. So here's the trochlea. Uh, we keep moving around. Right here, there is a conjunctival epithelium surface covering the tissues. Um, here is the vast area we could identify. So there's conj, the conjunctiva kind of blends into an epithelium that partially covers that sclera that I've mentioned. So fairly convinced that this is limbus. So a fragment of the sclera was left behind and the peripheral corneum. Right next to it, here's that pigment that we were talking about. Um, so if we go a little closer, you see that it does look like uveal tissue. Again, it is a cat. So um, probably light colored or blue eyed cat. There's a a uvule-like stroma here and adjacent to it, there's some melanin pigment or you know, either free or some um, melanocytes keep going down. This almost looks like a ciliary body muscle. Again, keep your imaginoscope turned up to 11. Otherwise, you might not be convinced. And kind of the same thing, these are obviously ciliary body plicae that were left behind. So we have non-pigmented and pigmented epithelium and some proliferating epithelium. So now we kind of understand what we're seeing. There's some remnants of ocular tissue and there's an obvious uh, cellular infiltrate surrounding it. So you should be very familiar with um, what these guys look like now. C of round cells. Um, here are a bunch of uh, macrophages that are laden with, um, you know, peppered with uh, remnants of these neoplastic cells. So these are apoptotic remnants, and this gives that appearance that some people like to describe as a starry sky appearance for those uh, uh, art aficionados out there. When you get a little closer, it becomes clear that we have a round cell population. Gideon described it pretty well in the previous one. But this really looks like a lymphoma again. And you got your uh, tangible body macrophages, which are the macrophages that are phagocytizing all those um, degenerated cells, apoptotic slash necrotic debris. When we move a little deeper in the tissue, it's... Um, Here's, this is a pattern that we see with um, 
neoplastic masses or tissues that outgrow their vascular supply. So there's a lot of necrosis. Everything that you see here, the eosinophilic, the pink is necrotic tissue. And you see islands of neoplastic cell or viable neoplastic cells surviving around blood vessels, right? So this is a pattern of survival around blood vessels. Uh, so interesting uh, case, the diagnosis was relatively straightforward in terms of lymphoma, but the history is interesting because of the suggestion that the cat was, inucle uh, was inucleated about, you know, about 10 years ago, right? The said kitten, the cat is 10 years of age, maybe nine years ago. Uh, so the question here, uh, this um, type of lymphoma in the eye, let's say if there was an ocular tissue surrounding and we have this infiltrative uh, 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 tumor effacing the ocular tissue, we would favor the diagnosis of what we call a post-traumatic lymphoma or a, uh, a chronic um, inflammation associated lymphoma. Uh, I think that's the new terminology we're going with. Um, here, it's kind of hard to tell because we don't have an eye to uh, assess the distribution of the tissue. It's more like a lymphoma that took over a cavity here, the, the, the orbital tissue, uh, and there is some remnants of the eye in there. So um, it's been a long time since they've enucleated this cat. So was there a tumor then that just progressed? I think kind of less likely. Uh, 10 years of uh, lymphoma growth, I think, would have been enough to do the trick on this cat. But uh, so likely at some point, there was this the remnants of ocular tissue there, a brewing uh, orbital cellulitis uh, leftover pen of thomitis, whatever you want to call it. And some of those uh, infiltrating lymphocytes decided to go to the dark side and became malignant. Uh, not dark side as in uh, melanoma, but dark side as, uh, as in tumor. And we end up with what we call an ocular large cell, ocular slash orbital large cell lymphoma in this case, right? Because it's uh, it's just a little bit hard to um, address the whole pathogenesis. So ocular large cell lymphoma, dirty margins, remnants of conjunctival sclera and nuclear tissue in orbital space. And there's that history. So regardless here, um, margins are obviously compromised, so likely that it will return. As being a lymphoma, uh, there's always the possibility that the neoplasm will become systemic, right? Even if it's kind of a primary uh, a, a tumor to develop in the orbit because of the inflammation, there's nothing um, uh, preventing those neoplastic cells, especially because that's what they do. They're lymphocytes and they, you know, they circulate to uh, gain access to the systemic uh, circulation, just this cat might develop a systemic tumor associated with this primary mass. All right, I guess we're done with lymphomas for the day. This next one is as just cute. There's no way around that. Look at that thing. <laughs> so this is an eight year, 10 month old main neuter English Labrador Retriever. I don't know if that is a breed or it is a Labrador retriever that was born in the UK or England. But um, it we received the right eye with a history of uveitis and secondary glaucoma on ultrasound. They found retinal detachment. And uh, I think that's circumscribed. And a circumscribed mass that was hyperechoic in the region of the optic nerve head. Um, and they've been created. Yeah, great description. I think they uh, we are all in agreement with that. It's a beautiful, well-delineated round mass that is um, affecting the central retina and the optic nerve. We, we can't see the optic nerve head, but if you trace a direct line with a extra scleral portion of the optic nerve, we can sort of, you know, suggest that it's at the correct location for being associated with the optic nerve head. You can see that there's retinal detachment and maybe some retinal tear. 
there is hemorrhage in the subretinal space, in the vitreous space, and along with the retina. The retina is plastered against the lens. There's some lenticular opacity. In the front of the eye, there might be some uh, a little bit of high theme there, but not much. So a lot of the business is uh, there in the back of the eye. So let's take a look at the subrows. Beautiful section. Let me clean this up a little bit. Yeah, didn't work, but that's fine. I think my shirt is probably dirtier than the slide. Uh, here's the corneum, both iris leaflets, pretty quiet on the interior segment front. Uh, when we get to the back, here's the optic nerve, optic nerve head. It, it, there, there's some cupping of the optic nerve head. The retina is relatively distorted. And we're kind of getting into, you know, if you think about cutting through, getting into the bulk of the mass, but you can see it already there. As we saw on the gross image, there's some vitreo hemorrhage, right? And there's some retinal detachment and retinal tear. You can see that folded edge right there. Some asteroid bodies and that um, exudate here in the vitreous surrounding the lens. So let's go straight down into the eye. What are we doing here? Um, let's go over the interior segment pretty quick. They talked about glaucoma. Did they say glaucoma? Yeah. There is indeed, uh, well, in the corner, there's a little bit of vascularization, not a lot going on. I will try to clean this up again because it does bother me a little bit. So let's see. Now a proper cleaning implement in a paper towel. Here you go. Look at that. There's just some stuff there, but it's okay. There is a pre renal fibrovascular membrane causing ectropia uvea. See how that uh, iris leaflet, uh, the edges kind of curl outside or outwards. Uh, there is an area of posterior sneakia where that fibrovascular membrane contacts the anterior lens capsule. That is all secondary, but might explain the glaucoma. And there is the main um, situation here. As I said, Cupping of the optic nerve. Oh, how do I know? You know, there's all this tissue there. If you get a little closer, one of the things you will observe is um, if you trace a line between the choroid on both sides, that's where the lamina cribosa should have been, right? So at this uh, level, and if you go and look where it is, you can see that the collagen beams of the lamina cribosa are posteriorly displaced. So this is all due to cupping and atrophy of the optic nerve. And what you're seeing here is basically retinal tissue that got pulled in with a cupped optic nerve. So there's atrophy cupping that confirms the diagnosis of glaucoma in a way. Uh, and, uh, but there's more to it. Here's the retina, uh, the central retina. It's uh, markedly cellular to the periphery or in the area surrounding the mass. But here's a the main thing. So there is a, as we've seen, a well delineated mass. It's composed of these um, redundant um, fusiform to elongated cells. They have this beautiful sort of story form whirling type of uh, arrangement with some nice um, vascular supply in the background. They form, you know, sheets, streams, these whirls that, that I've mentioned. There are some areas of the crosis, like we're moving into an area right now. Um, and there's this uh, interesting uh, supporting stroma in the back. If you look adjacent to the main mass, the retina is not completely normal. Uh, moving a little bit to the side, there's really nothing normal about this retina. This is all necrotic and degenerated, but yeah, there's no blood about it. I, it's all necrotic and degenerated. I was trying to see if there was an area of um, more obvious area of transition. Again, you know, be kind and um, 
allow me to make my point here. This is not normal, but you can see ganglion cells. There's a markedly degenerated outer retina, but it's still retina-like, right? And then you move a little bit to this side and right there, things change. Much more cellular with some fusiform cells and lots and lots and lots of these uh, vessels infiltrating and distorting the tissue. And there's just the obvious um, neoplastic population of cells. So the retina adjacent to the mass, it's at least gliotic or extremely gliotic and, and vascularized. Um, one of the things that we see sometimes with these tumors is this uh, adjacent to the mass, this marked vascularization, sometimes forming glomerular-like tufts. So we diagnose a retinal glioma in this case, um, we usually call those retina slash optic nerve gliomas. They can uh, uh, arise from either the retina, the central retina, the optic nerve, or, or both. Um, one of the things that we don't have here is the ne uh, any neoplastic cell extension into the optic nerve, which is the main uh, uh, prognostic feature in this, these cases, is extension beyond the optic nerve, which suggests a possible recurrence at the optic nerve or, and or extension into the brain. We've seen cases where the tumor will use the uh, uh, um, optic nerve tract to go all the way back to the brain. It's a very easy, easy way to get there. Uh, so this is our diagnosis and uh, secondary glaucoma. We usually do not classify the gliomas in the optic nerve. Uh, if you use the WHO classification, they will all... Um, kind of fit into the more generalized sort of high-grade mixed tumor. Uh, but that, um, you know, that you, you will use for the other central nervous system gliomas. But that doesn't necessarily correlate well with the prognosis. As I said, if you got clean margins on a tumor like that in the eye, the prognosis is, is, is good and they will, they rarely metastasize. Not that we know, I don't think we have anyone that we confirm metastasis. And uh, the only problem will be regrowth into the optic nerve and towards the brain. So optic nerve, retinal glioma, clean optic nerve margins, diffuse retinal detachment, and a chronic secondary glaucoma. All right, next one. Here's a uh, classic, good-looking example of this. How are we doing? You got five minutes. I think that's all I need for this, to be honest. This is a four-year-old male neuter Labrador retriever dog. Um, all right, clinical history, classified information. We do not have clearance to assess the clinical history of this patient. So we're gonna go with what we see here, which is pretty straightforward. Here's a frontal view. There is a kind of a dark tissue infiltrating the peripheral cornea, kind of haziness of the adjacent corneal tissue and on a cross section, there is a black mass that infiltrates the iris, the ciliary body, and the peripheral cornea. You can see here that uh, infiltration and the adjacent kind of yellowish discoloration. So gross, let's start with this one here. Pretty similar situation where you have, now you can identify more readily the iris. So here's the uh, dilator, a little bit of the dilator and the sphincter muscle. So the iris is infiltrated and effaced or partially effaced by this dark neoplastic cell. The ciliary body is not that affected, uh, at least in this um, section here, but the mass does infiltrate the peripheral cornea, uh, more likely, more uh, specifically, the deeper portions of it. So the mass is likely dissecting between decimus membrane and the corneal stroma. There's sort of a patent space there where uh, any cells can get, to be honest. So uh, we do have a deeper section to sample a little bit better. Shows the mass going a little bit further into the ciliary body and facing the iridocorneal angle and how they are infiltrating the peripheral, uh, the, the deep peripheral corneal stroma. 
So let's go back to that. Well, you know what? Don't have much time. So I'm just going to go straight to this one. And then we can go back to the to the other one for more of the coronal lesions. So here's that mass. Again, diagnosis here, not really a challenge, right? It's a pigmented neoplasm in the eye. It's a melanocytic tumor until proven otherwise, and I don't think we'll be able to do so. So it is a melanocytic tumor. The main differentials here are a melanocytoma or a melanoma. The camera hates <laughs> super dark backgrounds. It will not let me focus on things. So you will have to trust me on this one. No mitotic figures were seen. So we call this a melanocytoma. Uh, so relatively benign tumor. One of the main differentials here for something like, uh, or, or for something on clinic um, is, uh, especially with that um, initial image, so let me go back there pretty quick and keep, keep that here, especially with this, right? Of course, uh, unless you do an ultrasound, you're not going to have an image that kind of looks like that. So you have something like this will be, is this a primary intraocular tumor that's infiltrated in the cornea or is this like a limbo melanocytoma that's infiltrated in the cornea or not? Every time we see a mass inside the eye with a, an associated extra scleral uh, or extra ocular, either scleral or orbital extension, we assume um, the mass started in the uveal tissue and then extended outwards because that's the more common scenario, which is what happened here. Um, another cool thing, you guys saw that um, kind of yellowish uh, discoloration of the cornea adjacent to the mass, and this is because of these guys. Um, we uh, affectionately call them coplocytes we don't have a good name for them. But these are all macrophages that are phagocytizing all that necrotic melanin pigment. I think phagocytizing and metabolizing it. And you end up with this kind of lipid laden, like a, you know, a, a, a pigment laden macrophages here. If you do a PAS, they are strongly positive for PAS. So I think some of it could be a mixture of whatever uh, a metabolite, but something like seroid or um, yeah, more like a seroid or a, a, me a, a melanin uh, uh, metabolite. And we do have also some lipid in the background because of probably the breakdown of the, the cell wall. So it's very, very common to see this type of uh, keratopathy associated in, 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 sorry, this type of infiltrate in the corneal stroma adjacent to uh, uh, neoplastic masses that infiltrate the corneal stroma, more specifically, um, you know, me uh, melanocytic tumors. Here's a, a cute little uh, area of mineralization of the stroma with a multinucleated macrophage that doesn't know if it wants to eat melanin or mineral and just went for the whole buffet there, I guess. So, um, yeah, so lipid keratopathy. So this would be a anterior uveal melanocytoma with corneal stromal infiltration and an adjacent lipid keratopathy. Uh, again, good prognosis, uh, complete excision, rarely metastasize, and um, will probably not recur in this case. I got two minutes to spare, which uh, pretty good, and uh, we'll. Leave you guys there. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you in two weeks.